Hello and welcome to Encore. Coming up in today's show, we're joined by Robert Longo. The artist who made his name in 1980s New York is bringing a new show to Paris. He takes us on a visual journey from earthly struggles to the nirvana of artistic creation. Luminous Discontent is a monochrome take on his vision of the world, featuring his signature charcoal drawings. Robert Longo, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Now, your show, Luminous Discontent, is at the Tadeus Ropak Gallery at the moment in Paris. Before we talk about the work itself, I'd like to talk about the title. You get the idea of two extremes here, light and dark. Can you tell us about the theme that unites these pieces? I unite them. I mean, I'm, I'm the center of, that, that connects it all. But the Luminous Discontent came from, I was listening to a Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon, where they talk about quiet resignation as the English way. And as an American, I'm not very happy with the world the way it is. And I mean, I think we live in this world, particularly in America, of this kind of illusion and between reality television and crazy politics and sports and things like that, that avoid us f to face what's going on in the world. And um, at the same time, I, I really like life, you know, I mean, I remember reading someplace where Beethoven said he hated people, but he loved mankind. You know, I mean, I mean, I have, I'm very fortunate. I have a great family. I have a great life. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I think you value your life by how the rest of the world treats the least fortunate. So, I mean, there's a political aspect to my life that has to do with the fact that I want to be able to enjoy my life. At the same time, I don't want to feel horrible about, about what's going on in the world. So the the dichotomy that exists in that title is really pretty much is I'm pretty pissed off but what's going on with, but at the same time I think it's quite miraculous so okay well without further ado let's take a look at some of the work in that show <laughs> Now, when you visit the gallery, it's organised across three floors. You almost get this notion of a, a holy trinity. There's certainly a tripartite idea there. Are you trying to create a religious experience with your art? <laughs> well, art is my religion. And I think art is a religion in a certain way because it is about believing in something. But what's great about art is not a whole lot of people have been killed in the name of it. So as a religion, I think it's pretty good. I also think art is this form of understanding like the way science is understanding or sociology is understanding or it's a form of understanding that I think has the capacity to hold lots of ideas and it may be the best way of understanding our contemporary situation. So, I mean, in that sense, the exhibition was really planned out really quite thoroughly. I mean, I make a model of the space and I mean, the human brain works where if you give it enough information, it kind of creates a narrative anyway. So I was trying to mess with the narrative a little bit, try to create a situation when you first come in the gallery, you don't quite know what's going on. When you turn around the corner, you bam, you get hit by something very clear what it is. So there, there were a lot of things that went on. To, I mean, also you have to understand, as an artist, doing exhibitions in galleries is really like the last time you really get to control the work before it does, if it does sell, you never know where it ends up. So place becomes a vehicle for meaning. So in that sense, it's really, it becomes very important that way. Mm -hmm. Well, we went to check it out in situ, and let's hear what people had to say about it. I can't believe they are drawings. You would think they are photos. We're unsettled by his works, but I'd say pleasantly unsettled. <laughs> I used to really enjoy his work back in the 80s and 90s. I thought it conveyed a kind of rock and roll energy. Nowadays, it's become very technical, efficient, but less interesting, more cold. They're inspired by the mysticism of great painters. It's his dramatic vision of the world. He's melancholy. He paints sadness, beauty. beauty. 
Now we can see there that you've paid homage to some great artists. There's uh, references to Rembrandt, Van Gogh, even Samuel Beckett, in fact, I was quite surprised to see. The piece that struck me the most, in fact, was called Shipwreck Redux. Um, perhaps a reference to a painting that's here in Paris at the Louvre by Géricault. Tell me, what does a 19th century artist have to say to you today, a 21st century artist? That things haven't changed that much. I mean, I. This exhibition, in a weird way, is a kind of love letter to Paris. I lived in Paris for like maybe three years, and I've always had this very special relationship with it. Whenever I come to Paris, I usually make one of my first stops to go see the, the Raft of Medusa. I've read lots of books about the Raft of Medusa, and one of the things I found fascinating was that, that the story of the Raft of Medusa has to do with the disparity of wealth, of the difference of aristocrats and, you know, plebeians and how that raft was basically cut loose and how they came back, told told the media about it. it it's it not a whole lot different than what's going on in the United States right now. I mean, in the sense of disparity of wealth and things like that. Now, you've featured violence and brutality in your work before you've dealt with 9-11. As an artist, what is your role in all of this? Is it just to report on what's going on or is it to change something? I don't choose to be political or, you know, in that sense, but I'm I'm compelled to be because this is the world I live in and and uh, these are images that exist and I mean I think I choose to make realistic images because of all the illusions in the world that I, I want to I want you to look at what at the same time I want you to see that there is some beauty in all this which is ironic you know I mean the idea of making making art out of catastrophe I I learned from the Raft of Medusa I mean it's an incredibly beautiful painting but this is horrible these people were eating each other and killing each other I mean so there is this kind of magical aspect to it that I found really fascinating I mean I found the bullet hole incredibly beautiful yeah you know so it was like and I remember seeing the photograph and I bought the rights to use the photograph and I, it's all been altered quite a bit you know and the idea also about, about actually making the work has to do with the difference between the instant that it takes to take a photograph, the work is made on a level, almost on a molecular level. I take this into me and process it over months. And it's a kind of understanding of an image that is more than just simply looking at it, which is important to me. Now, you've also collaborated in, with musicians. You've mm -hmm. worked a lot of music. You make music yourself. In fact, you've had high praise from within the industry, David Bowie said that Robert Longo produced what's essentially the best cover art of the 1980s and beyond for Glenn Branca's The Ascension. Bo was someone who made music and he made visual art as well. For you, what's the major difference creatively between these two disciplines? I think what's interesting about music is, is the formal aspect of music is that anyone can imagine what it looks like. You know what I mean? In, in that sense that... I remember I did a bunch of rock videos, but when I was, was, I didn't really know MTV at that time. This is like the mid 80s or something like that. And this band, Golden Palominos, asked me to do this rock video. And I, I watched MTV. I remember seeing like uh, Billy Idol's B White Wedding, and it was just horrible. <laughs> this idea of actually trying to literally illustrate something, which was, and I remember trying to make the video, and I just didn't, very confused. And the first video I made, I tried to imitate this kind of look. and the the head of the band Michael Stipen from REM and this guy Anton um, told me that's not what we want we want we want your art and I realized at that point I sh I could make I should make a rock video that's about what the music evokes so I think I'm jealous of music because it doesn't have this prescribed image and that the videos that rock video that I tried to make were was about what I thought the music evoked rather than what it illustrated I mean illustration is I'm not so interested in that in a sense. Now, the work that you were making at that time, in the 1980s, a very famous series, Men in the Cities, it was phenomenally successful, it was reimagined, recycled, it even, you know, borrowed perhaps sometimes. How do you feel about the process of reappropriation of images? Is it stealing? Well, I'm an image thief by nature, so, I mean, I, you know, I do get pissed off about it every now and then, but... Um, Sometimes they actually ask permission for it, but there was a, I had an interesting scenario where at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, there was a big exhibition called Pictures, and it was my generation. And they, in the lobby, the grand lobby of the museum, they had three big drawings of men in the cities. Um, one of them was actually Cindy Sherman. One of them was Glenn Branca. Another one was this other rock guy, a friend of mine. And at the opening, my son at the time was 15 years old. His girlfriend asked me, 
these drawings are 30 years old. She asked me, did I get the idea for these drawings from the iPod ads? And I realized at that point, what's interesting is if you're successful enough as an artist to create an archetype, you, you lose authorship of something, which is actually a kind of flattering way that the work has succeeded. On the other hand, I mean, I gave American Psycho the right to use the images in the film, but now they have a musical American Psycho. Now they're using images that are similar to my images. And the irony is when I walk into my studio every day on Center Street in Manhattan, there's a big billboard for American Psycho that looks my my work. So some people think I'm making lots of money by the like the the trailer for Mad Men, the guy you have seen that. Yeah. Or the iPod ads. They think I'm making money from these things. I'm not. I mean it's it's, it's just it. it's a kind of compliment for sure. But I mean it's interesting. I spent a great deal of my early once that I stopped doing that work in the in mid eighties, eighty three, and I basically have been running away from it. Only recently have I decided to try to claim authorship on it again. I mean, it was it was really interesting to make something that was so established and then I just wanted to do other things for sure. Mm, it's definitely become iconic in the public domain. That is sadly all we've got time for, Robert Longo. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll leave you with a taste of some of your past work accompanied by Godspeed You Black Emperor, one of your favourite pieces of music. Remember, you can get more culture news on our website or also on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.